Mugar. Together with my husband, Pat Grubb, we publish the All Point Bulletin newspaper in Point Roberts, Washington. We're standing in front of the old Thorstenson House, one of the earliest home sites in Point Roberts. Recently, the Point Roberts Historical Society announced plans to restore the house and turn it into a museum to showcase items of historical interest. An ambitious project such as this requires the help of many people and a great deal of money. Today we'll be speaking to individuals who are working on the restoration project as well as those whose lives were touched by this house in the early days of Point Roberts. We hope you enjoy it. We're looking at the original 1899 homestead of the Thorstenson family on the left and the 1913 edition on the right. I would like to read a brief excerpt from a book written by Runa, Helgi and Dagbjort's daughter, in 1975. In 1899, Helgi started building a new house, not far from the old log house. It was built of planks from the beach with tar paper and shingles on the outside. Wallpaper over cheesecloth on the inside walls made a very comfortable home. It was finished early in 1900 at the cost of $800, which was mostly for shingles, nails, finished lumber, windows and doors, etc. March 3, 1900, a baby boy was born. They named him Jonas for Helgi's favorite brother in Iceland. 1900 was also the year that Helgi and Paul became U.S. citizens, and with them, their wives and children. Helgi and Daga were very happy in their new home, and it was always open to friends and even strangers who happened to stop by. They were welcomed, and soon the kettle was on for a friendly visit and a cup of coffee. Fashion that they really didn't lend themselves. We now will talk with Shelley Damewood, representing the Point Roberts Historical and Society. Then, of course, this particular house has not been touched since 1913, and retains a lot of the old charm that that we we were looking for in in deciding to put our efforts into restoring a house. Can you give us a sense of how this home relates to the history of Point Roberts? Well, I think that it's probably been pretty well documented that this is the Thor original Helgi Thorstensen home. And it w when he homesteaded here, he built this house in 1898. And this house in particular is specific to the point and that it's built out of, out of material salvaged from the beach, from the fish traps that were here in the, in the, during that time. And I think that that is why this house is is probably could stand as sort of a memorial to the to the early settlers, the Icelanders, the Danes, the the Norwegians, and and everyone else who came here in that early time and and worked so hard to make this point work for them. Shelley, do you think the historical society will have the community support to bring about a costly move and restoration of the Thorstensen homestead? I believe that this is probably a fundraiser that will elicit a lot of support among among all of the residents of Point Roberts, certainly the, the people who have come here during the summers year after year after year since the early 1900s, and um, the descendants of the, old, of the old pioneer families who have very strong ties to Point Roberts in that they come up every year for, for the annual Point Roberts Pioneer Reunion, which is, is fun and a real testimony to how people feel about the point because they have a, a wonderful turnout. And I think this project will really appeal to them because we, the Historical Society feels that if we don't preserve the, these houses now, that they're going to be lost through development or, or just, you know, disrepair and neglect. And I would hope that, I would hope that we would have that kind of, kind of support from the community. How does the Point Roberts Historical Society propose to fund the move and restoration of the Helgi Thorstensen homestead? What we've done, we've we've charted a path of of fundraising techniques, and what what I found in some of my research is that you have to have broad-based community support, and we're starting to do that to do that now. With and we're going to promote a series of fundraisers throughout the year. To, to let the community know that we, you know, we're serious in what we're doing. We will be doing some in, um, initial restorative work in, in trying to halt the, the decay that's, that's probably going to happen now. We have a two-year time frame, and what we're doing, we're going to have the initial fundraisers, and then we, all, we will be applying for grants from several of the private foundations. And this particular house, unfortunately, does not fall under the Washington State guidelines.
Alliance for Historic Preservation because it has to be removed from the site because of the of the land ownership. And in that case, we are kind of out on our own as far as getting the, the needed support from the community. So we And there are about six foundations in the state that will provide funds for historic, for museums and things like that. We understand that the house will showcase many of the Point Roberts historical artifacts. Could you describe some of these for us? Um, some of them come from the original home site itself. The Thorstenson family certainly has. They've they've saved and retrieved and restored some of the original furnishings from the home, and they have them. And, I'm, and they've indicated that they would be happy to see them reposited in in the old in the old homes in the old homestead. There are certainly there are there's farm equipment along the with residing with some of the farmers from, you know, descendants of the farmers. Also, we, most of all, what we have are papers and archi archival materials and pictures from family uh, family albums that people would like to see in a, in a place where everybody can access them. But people aren't willing to, to give them to the historical society unless it has a place, unless they have a permanent home, and I can understand that. I, I certainly wouldn't want them residing in somebody's basement for, for 10, 15 years while the, while the Historical Society gets its act together. But uh, there are some lovely things, and people, you know, three or four people have come up to me since this fundraising campaign began, and they said, oh, we've got some wonderful things, and we'd like to put them to the, you know, give them to the Historical Society, but mm -hmm. they're, they're waiting until we have a home. So I'm looking, I'm really looking, I'm really hoping that this particular project will, will see a great conclusion. Would you like to see a museum here in the history of Point Roberts? Surely, I think it would be great. Yeah, it would be great. Unfortunately, I haven't been here long enough to, to uh, have very much information on what they're doing other than what I read in the Point. Oh, good. Yeah, well, then it would yeah. be very helpful to you. <laughs> it would be great to have a museum. It would be wonderful. I think it's an excellent idea. It'll be great for people to come and learn about Point Roberts and... I think it'll be dynamite. I'm really looking forward to it because I don't really even know that much about it. And I've lived here three and a half years. Terrific. Yeah. Right. Well, we hope we hope to see one here soon. Yeah, I hope so. That makes it uh, equally important. And Brian Hart is a Ladner architect whose specialty is the restoration of heritage homes. We asked him about his background in restoration of historic buildings and his discussions with the Point Roberts Historical Society. My wife and I have been a resident in Ladner in 20 years and we were involved in the heritage movement there pretty well from the time that we arrived in town. I was uh, the chairman of the Delta Heritage Society for five years and uh, doing the research with that group it's inevitable that we come across common history between uh, the Ladner Delta uh, development and Point Roberts. So we, and we also had in those days some joint meetings with people who are interested in heritage in Point Roberts. So we got to meet a few of the people who were involved uh, back probably in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, my wife and I have also just liked the special character of Point Roberts and we are frequent tourists to the area since it's not that long a drive and uh, we do sightseeing down here and again the um, quite large collection of fine old cottages and older buildings has always uh, interested us uh, quite a lot. Polly DeHaan called one day and asked if uh, I could come down and help them pick one of three houses that might be um, a restoration project. When she told me which three houses were involved it became pretty clear pretty quickly that this would be at least our first choice and then we came down one day and took a look at it and uh, it was clearly head and shoulders above the others. Not that the others would not have been good projects but this one just happened to have some extra special features that made it important. Well let's go take a look inside. From an architectural and historic standpoint, can you give us your assessment of the home's value in this context? I think that the house could be considered important from three um, points of view or attitudes. One, the house uh, purely from age is important. It uh, probably dates from the 1890s. Uh, in the context of the development of Point Roberts, it makes it mo probably one of the oldest remaining homes uh, around. I haven't done a detailed study of all of them. And uh, from that point of view, it should be considered very important. Secondly, because it was um, constructed by one of the original members of the Icelandic community, which is the largest single um, pioneering community in the area, that makes it 
uh, equally important. And then finally, the construction is relatively unique. Um, most people are familiar with houses built with studs. We see them going up every day. This house has no studs. The entire construction of the house, as you can see here, is made up of plank, two inches thick. And they, are, they run vertically, and, that, and there's no thickness in the wall. There's no insulation. The shingles were put on the outside. And the interior was finished in a variety of ways. The, you can see here some remnants of some muslin. And that was put on, especially on the exterior walls, to stop drafts but also on the interior walls just to give them a finish. The other thing that uh, uh, has been suggested locally, and there's lots of evidence here, is that these boards weren't cut for this house. They were used elsewhere, probably in fish traps. And you can see stains and pieces of the large nails uh, left from that, and, and various stains that show that they were in different positions. Um, if they were used in fish traps, that means they've also been salt cured. So this wood would take a very long time to uh, decay because uh, having been in the uh, salt water for a period of time, um, it would get a preservation, which is uh, quite a good preservation technique. Uh, I made a comment that this is relatively unique. Um, this was a common uh, construction type in California where climate is very benign. Uh, in fact, if you look at the refugee houses that were built after the San Francisco earthquake, there were five or 6,000 of them built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in a very short period of time, and this is the way that they were constructed. As you come up through Oregon and Washington, you see less and less uh, houses in this type of construction. There is one in Bellingham that's on the National Register, I believe. Could you describe the steps that would be necessary for the moving and restoration of the Helgi Thorstensen homestead, including a breakdown of what this might cost? Um, basically, there are a couple of steps that are not prioritized at this point in time. I think it's fairly important that a detailed survey of the house be done, and this uh, involves a couple of things. It involves producing a set of drawings of what's here. It involves doing a detailed examination of the condition, especially underneath. I mean, there's so much um, bramble growth around that nobody's been underneath this house for years, and we don't know what condition the, the sills and beams are under there. So that they all have to be exposed and examined, and uh, a determination of what repairs are going to be necessary. And then because the house is being proposed as a museum, which is a public use building, uh, at that feasibility stage also um, a code examination would be required. Um, this is very unique and it was, it's likely that uh, uh, code appeals would be involved in, in developing its use. It's an important enough building to make those appeals. If the house were threatened with demolition, if there was a uh, development imminent in this area, uh, then the first priority would be to get the house off the site uh, to avoid the demolition. Um, the second uh, important aspect of the physical work is stabilization. We determine what areas need work immediately. Um, if there's not money to put a new roof on, we patch the holes in the roof with whatever is available just to keep the water from running in and doing more damage. If there is rot going on, we make sure that the air can get at us, so we take away the conditions of rot. So stabilization is really important. And from that point on, um, it's a matter of funding and availability. A roof is clearly important on this house, and as soon as the funds were available, a roof could be done even before it was moved. Uh, exterior work can be done. Um, and should be done as, as the next priority in terms of uh, restoration and painting the exterior, fixing the windows. In other words, anything that has to do with the weathering of the building. Uh, foundations, clearly, once it gets to its permanent site. Um, but uh, the house was probably, I haven't been underneath, but it's probably built on wood foundations, and that would probably be its uh, future uh, foundation system as well. And then the last one would be to come inside and deal with the issues of how much of the material you want to leave exposed, how much you cover, as they would have done. Uh, and how you incorporate that into museum use and uh, display, that type of thing. Um, and that is clearly best done when it's on its new site, rather than doing that ahead of time. Moving these buildings usually does not involve very much damage. Uh, we've moved very large houses and not even had a cracked window pane. So the, uh, a lot of this work, stabilization and then restoration, could be done here even while it's waiting to be moved. In terms of costs, I think that uh, for a global estimate, we would say this project is a $100,000 project, plus or minus. I'm quite confident it could not be done for 50, unless there was a really substantial amount of volunteer labor and, and donation of materials and, and kind. Uh, we could run the cost up well above 100000 in the ways that we do things, but I think that's a good target for now. 
and the, the cost that we would allow for basically, and these are, I want to uh, clarify, are based on Canadian experience. Uh, we've not done any restoration in the United States and we don't have detailed construction costs, but if the same project was being done in Delta, for example, we would allow ten to $15,000 for a move. Um, we would allow um, $8,000 for a roof, approximately for a house this size. We would allow probably up to $10,000 for foundation work. Uh, we would have to allow for some structural repairs. There's obviously a few places where uh, there is some rot that's going to have to be repaired, and we might allow four or $5,000 for that. All of these items and the co a detailed cost estimate would be one of the results that uh, a feasibility study would provide. And that feasibility study, which is also a cost of the project, would be somewhere in the neighborhood of five to $10,000 based on the experience we have. And that would identify the issues, identify the costs, and do drawings and code analysis to go along with that. So, and what, what's very difficult to project right now is the types of costs that upgrading to code compliance might uh, might involve. If the funding was in place and the code um, issues have been dealt with, a permit had been issued, then the work on site would take a relatively short period of time, probably in the neighborhood of three months, possibly four. Um, what I can't tell you is how, how long it would take to process the uh, building permit in Whatcom County because we don't have the experience in that area. So, But basically the physical work on site with a full crew could go really quite rapidly and then if there's a lot of volunteer labor then it would be extended out from there. We've talked about the boards already. Over top of the boards was put a very plain paper uh, as a, an original finish. Over top of that the room was decorated and we see this decoration elsewhere in the house with uh, photos and cutouts from early magazines. This particular one is a uh, Seattle Post Intelligencer from September 18, 1901, and the, there are dates uh, earlier than that in the kitchen as well. So it, it, it affirms to us that we've got the construction date fairly well tied down, and this is in the original portion of the house. The uh, Over top of that again is the muslin layer, so that was a, a later uh, wall finish, and then what's been removed from this wall are several layers of wallpaper as well. So you can see the history of how the house was done, from plain paper to decorated to much more ornamental wallpapers later on in the history of the house. Part of the history of the house is also the history of uh, the country because this piece, and we're not sure entirely which magazine it came out of, although the rest of them were a women's home companion, deals with beautiful young women of the nation's capital and included, it would be the equivalent of the debutante or the coming out, and included some of the people in here as the uh, granddaughter of General Grant, uh, the daughter of the Secretary of War, uh, there's a number of people here. And those were, would be nationally important, not just locally. So it was kind of fun to get part of that history built into the history of this house. Well, it has a great history, this little enclave here. And I'm sure it would be interesting to most people. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, it's, uh, it seems like um, you sometimes forget how uh, there is history here. It seems like a new place. And there is a lot of history. Yeah, yeah, so I'd like to see that happen. Bob Thorsonson is the grandson of the pioneer Thorsonson family who built this homestead in 1899. Mr. Thorsonson, can you give us some of the history of the Thorsonson family homestead? When it was built, who built it, and anything you know about the structure itself? Well, the story of the Thorsonson homestead actually goes back ways goes back to Iceland where Thorsonsons came from. The two Thorsonsons coming to Paul Rivers were Paul Thorsonson and Helgi Thorsonson. They had the homesteads adjacent to each other. Paul is Pauline's grandfather and Helgi is my grandfather. They were foster brothers in Iceland, not being from the same family but had the same farmer as a foster father. They shared the home that they purchased at Point Roberts for a number of years. An old log cabin, two-story log cabin. Do you believe that moving and restoring the original Thorstenson home is important to the community of Point Roberts? I think it's very important to preserve the last image or legacy of that era, about a 50-year period that was marked by the small farms and farmers, and when World War II came, people moved away, young people went in the army or military, others moved to the cities, and then the change of the communities took place. 
Is there any particular way you would like to see the home used if it is in fact moved and restored? I'd like to see it used as a receptacle for whatever old farm and household equipment can be found around the point, like butter churns and, and miscellaneous household equipment, farm equipment that people use in that area. Is there anything you would like to add? Well, I think one of the problems with the present location is on two pieces of property. And it's not very accessible, so it would be necessary to move it. It is very unique in its structure because it was built by things that people found on the beach. The 2 by 12 planks were drifted ashore from the traps, the nails they extracted from the planks. And that house, in fact, cost my grandfather $800 when he sailed his fishing boat to Blaine to buy nails, tar paper, and shingles for the house. Everything else was found on that beach. Can you tell us how long your family lived in this home and give us some insight into life in Point Roberts during this time period? The Helge Thorstensen family moved into their new home in 1900. They lived there until my grandmother died, Doug Gert. In 1941, she was 79 years old. Ellie then moved into his daughter's home. People had been stored. Her name was Runa. He lived until he was 85. He died in 1945. The addition was done to the house in 1913 when they had the expansion of the living room and upstairs area. Another interesting aspect of the home the back of the house was a large building with a carpenter shop, washing room, storage, a large woodshed. Behind that was a root house where they were able to keep their food for the winter, apples and potatoes and things. Also, of course, in those days, everybody had to have a smokehouse to smoke salmon and mutton and bacon and things, hams. And that Adjoining the house was an orchard that was planted with great forethought. It had all kinds of fruit growing throughout the season. So the final being winter apples that would, could be kept for the winter. Sure, I'd love to see anything to keep Point Roberts the way it is, you know, or the way it was. Well, I've lived in Point Roberts all my life, so I've pretty much seen it go from a farming community to a, a big gas station. And uh, from what I remember, I'd sure like to have that rather than this. You know, I'm a local business owner also, but I don't strive on on that. I like uh, keeping it somewhat sort of Point Robertsy. Here is Carl Julius, Point Roberts old timer, who will share some of his recollections with us. When I came to Point Roberts when I was six years old, actually, I came on a, a little ferry boat from. Uh, about a six-passenger ferry boat from Blaine to Point Roberts, and and, uh, and landed on the end of the dock in front of the uh, reef and breakers on the west side of Point Roberts. At that time, that was a, a workable dock, and that's where the uh, the mail boat from Bellingham came in there every day, but Sunday, to bring our mail to Point Roberts. Anyway, I landed there when I was six years old, Point Roberts from Blaine. And my dad got a job working for Mike Whalen, running the uh, the the work part of uh, running a summer resort. And Mr. Mike Whalen was getting a little elderly, and he was too much work for him. So my dad took over the farming part of it, and he made pretty good money while the two years he was there. So he thought farming there must be pretty good uh, money in farming. So he comes over to the west side at Point Roberts on the corner of Tyee Drive and APA Drive and bought 80 acres for $100 an acre. And of course, 21 years later, he still owed $1,000 on the mortgage, so there wasn't as much money in farming for himself as there was working for somebody else. Probably when I was uh, 10 years old, uh, Mr. Uh, Thorstensen, Helgi, uh, Logie's father, his name was Helgi, was raising Loganberries, and they hired the young kids to uh, 
picked the loganberries for him. He shipped them to Bellingham on the mail boat, which took off every day from the end of the dock on the west side. And uh, I do remember that, and that was probably about the first time when when the, the lady, I forget what Helgi's wife's name was, I, I remember her, but uh, she invited us kids in for milk and cookies. And I was about 10 years old. That's the first I recollect ever seeing the inside of this house. And it was probably the last time I'd ever been in this house, too, until today. I'm all for moving it. Uh, I think it's a good idea if, if we think that we can raise enough money to do it. So the cost is what I'm thinking about. You know, I'm, I'm one of these people that started out when I left home and graduated from high school. I, I went to California to get a job, and it was in 1932. Well, and that's what they called the Hungry Thirties. Well, when, when my pal and I got to uh, California in my Model T Ford, which I paid $40 for it, and I drove to California and got a job picking pizzas for 15 cents an hour. This has been the Point Bulletin. We hope you enjoyed the show. See you next time. We would like to thank Sylvia Schoenberg and Polly DeHan for providing us with historical photos and other material for this program.